I wanted to ask, uh, it, the novel Big Frank ends kind of perfunctory. I, I don't mean that as a criticism, but with Howard Hughes. And the character of Howard Hughes is a very interesting character in that he's kind of like Dr. Strangelove, Sans Love, and all of the strange. Uh, and his uh, interactions with Big Frank, there's hints of you know some James Bondian kind of things going on, but then his interaction with uh, with Big Frank is exactly that kind of thing where he's meeting the super villain and they're interacting and Big Frank actually isn't the super villain in, in this instance and he has some wacky ideas that even outstrip Dr. Strangelove. Let's talk a little bit about Howard Hughes because he used some of the myths of Hughes and put them in there but he also has some very uh, distinct characteristics that might not have been in Hughes' uh, palette there. Well, like I said, um, this book is, is really indebted to a lot of the 1960s Hollywood and European films that used a lot of stars. Things like It's a Mad, Mad World, um, the early Woody Allen films where, with Peter Sellers, um, the, the, the whole Peter Sellers all-star cast, uh, you know, uh, reviews. Uh, in the 1960s, you had a lot of European films where you had uh, four or five filmmakers doing 20-minute films, you know, things like Boccaccio 70 or something. Um, uh, and so it, it is perfectly reasonable to, to think that uh, since Howard Hughes had been mentioned before as possibly being the mule or funding the foundation with the mule as a figurehead or something, uh, you know, who better to have than... Uh, the guy who at the time was considered either the richest or second richest man in the world, at least private citizen in the world. Uh, and it was known that Howard Hughes uh, had the largest payroll, that he had he had people uh, on his staff who did things that no one knew what. I mean, we, when you look at government payrolls, there are there are black operations and there are there are government uh, uh, departments that no one knows what that what the hell do they do? Um, and Hughes had people working on things they had no clue about uh, uh, in there. And uh, uh, I think it's in uh, my spy book where I have a, a scene with Howard Hughes actually paying one of his doubles. And this is important because uh, it's known that Howard Hughes had doubles and it's, it's, it's stated that the mule may have had doubles too, which l leads one to think that Hughes might have been the mule. But it's all, it was also rumored uh, that Howard Hughes had uh, estates uh, and 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 whatnot. So I have Howard Hughes here in like Southern Arizona uh, or Southern Nevada, rather, uh, have this giant complex built into a butte, um, and you know it's it's this very thing from a Bond film that a Bond villain might have. You know, it opens up and it's in a mountain. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's it's a, it's actually a butte, but uh, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> He actually lives in a mountain, yeah. and it's all also very sterile in there. He needs it completely clean. Big Frank flicks a booger at him at one point, yeah. where and he he goes ape shit in that moment. Yeah, and uh, the the whole scene, in a sense, if Howard Hughes is not the mule, and we don't know in this book, and we, we'll never we're never going to know within my universe. I don't think I'm ever going to reveal. If the mule, who the mule really may have been, because I honestly, at this point, I don't know, and, and it's good to have him be indeterminate, especially in, as it relates to this cult that develops about, around the mule fifteen hundred years later. But Howard Hughes, if he is the mule, uh, you can imbue things into the things he says or does that could, perhaps could connect. But if he's not the mule, it's a great, it's a great red herring chapter because. It develops the character of Big Frank. It takes Big Frank out of New York because it also, as I early in the book, uh, in the trailers, I talk about the higher powers, that despite the power that we see that Paulie flexes and that Big Frank flexes, that there are people who are more sinister and more powerful than the mafia. Um, it reminds me of the bad sleep well. Yeah. Where you get the, the central evil characters, but you know that there are people that are worse that are pulling the strings. Right, and, and just we don't see the mule, just like we don't see the president of the corporation. It's the vice president who gets the call and goes on vacation after he's killed off uh, 
uh, Toshiro Mifune's character and has left his son. His son and his daughter revile him, don't want anything to do with him, but he's still there to serve the master that we never see. And it's a great scene. It's one of the great comments on corporate evil. And in fact, I'm going to actually bring that film up. Let me write that down. Um, Bad Sleep World for my corporate evil show that I'm going to uh, do. Um, but uh, uh, that character, just like the mule, is never seen. And, you know, you never want to show the monster fully. Um, you always, A monster is always more scary when you just see little bits or hear things of it. Um, Jacques, Jacques Tenour, a great B-film director, uh, was great at this. Film noir, at its best, does that. That things that are hidden in the shadows. Um, so we, Big Frank is pulled. He's summoned basically to Las Vegas. So uh, he he he's summoned to the the great man's throne basically to kiss his brass ring. And of course, Big Frank doesn't kiss anyone's ass, even Howard Hughes's. And he 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 winds through the serpentine uh, tunnel. There are some real characters in Las Vegas. The people at the hotel, he says, are real. If you look them up, you could find there that they were real minor mob figures. This is when Howard Hughes started buying up property in, in Las Vegas. and uh, Oh, I know. There's plenty of them with bonding fantasies, it seems like. Yeah. And, and uh, like I said, it's, it's a way to end. And let me see... Uh, if I look at the actual ending, oh, uh, and then he has the thing. This seems terribly important. Important. important, 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 important. He compels right over and over on every piece. Of it. So in small text, we said, if there is a base reality, even in fiction, uh, Aaron must be real somehow in some ways. And so, so we get Howard Hughes typing the same thing over and over again, and he seems as he. It seems very similar to the kind of rantings that the Mule has. You know, it that's taken, of course, from. Uh, uh, Kubrick's film, The Shining, where you know Johnny is a good boy, typed over and over again. We get we get all of these assorted nonsensical texts sort of slammed. The together. setup, the setup for Hughes to actually enter the scene with Big Frank is is hilarious too, where he's reading all these philosophic tracks, and then <laughs> right beside that, Doctor Seuss with the yeah. endless turtles re trying to reach the sky. Yeah. Uh, so he's he's certainly doing his juvenile homework there before he meets him and he does he plays into the myth of him as i was saying before because that was something that was always assumed with hughes that he was very obsessive not just the clean freak crap but also uh his repetitive nature and that's something that uh, is mimicked here as well and the ending too uh, is paired with the ending of the foundation big frank is the third book the, the the second book the mule ends with the insane rants of a character who may be the mule in in uh, I think it's Corridor Gray in the Insane Asylum underneath Creedmoor. And then we end with a very similar kind of display of insanity with Howard Hughes. So again, there's another connection back to the ending of the prior book. You could book. also say, too, that perhaps Hughes is a conduit for Manny Cole, just as the end section of the mule could be a conduit for Manny Cole. Yeah, but it's interesting, too. I, I structured, uh, if you look at the ending of Eugene O'Neill's A Long Day's Journey in Tonight. Uh, the insanity of the mother comes out in her last monologue. And in a similar fashion, I, I structure the last monologue here of Howard Hughes. You know, he's remembering some lover or something. And he goes, you know what? Uh, uh, and and I, I throw in a little Patrick McGowan here, you know. Uh, uh, no, sir. Number excuse six. me. Number six was just asking about the shipment to Seattle. I apologize. Go take care of that now, number six. What? You were number six. Who was number one? No. Howard Hughes says, no. Nothing is, uh, knowing is nothing. Nothing is known. No. Who is number one? No. On the floor he lay, drooling, eyes flickered with the income of light, daring memories lost. No. It was here that he smiled and the sacral pathos of humanity, of, of human dust, and reached out and uttered, oh, my Eleanor. So he's thinking of some woman he may have known. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm taking bits of O'Neill. I'm taking bits of the prisoner. I'm taking bits of uh, uh, the references to the mule at the end of the prior book and sort of blending them into a stew. And so we have basically a Howard Hughes whimpering, muttering in the dust, who starts who who starts this uh, uh, chapter that ends the book as as seemingly this mythic grand man, and he's just this quivering mass that ends up on the floor, just just blubbering and, and just ranting insa insanely. It's, it's the 
Greeks with real foibles instead of just having gargantuan characters that that's only in their myth. Once yeah. they you see them up close, you see them not as gargantuan characters, but frail little creatures like everyone else is. Yeah.